There's a line from the movie True Colors that comes to mind as I hear this particular question that Peter is asking Jesus about. How many times do I have to forgive? Jesus, you teach us. Turn the other cheek. What's the cutoff point, however? How long do I have to keep turning the other cheek before I can blast my neighbor into the next county? Surely, Jesus, you don't expect me to continue to just stand by passively accepting abuse upon abuse. Jesus then tells this story. A king who had been lending large sums of money to various servants, decides to settle up his accounts and calls in his notes. He starts with the guy who owes him the most money. So he calls in this person, and I'm going to call this guy Joe. He asks Joe for the billion dollars that he owes. Joe can't pay it. So the king orders Joe and his family to, to jail and that the only way to get release is that Joe gets the debt paid off in full. Well, Joe knows he can never pay such a debt back and he throws himself onto the mercy of the king. And the king, being struck by the man's sincerity, decides to forgive the debt that Joe owes. Now, a little later, Joe comes across Bill, who owes Joe about a year's wages. Mm, let's say about $20,000. Bill doesn't have the money right now to pay what he owes Joe. And in the same way as Joe had pleaded with the king, Bill pleads with Joe for just a little more time so that he can get his debt paid off. No deal. Uh-uh. Joe says to Bill, you're going to prison, man. Now, the other subjects who also owe the king money saw how Joe treated Bill, and they went to the king, and they pleaded on behalf of Bill. The king became incredibly angry toward Joe for his behavior toward Bill. So angry that he had Joe put into prison, and this time with orders that Joe is to be tortured until his original debt was paid in full. This parable is not only about justice, but also how do we pass on judgment? In the book, Conversations with Scripture, the Parables, Episcopal priest William Browsant suggests that even though this story might appear to focus on the king's mercy, the true focus truly is on the servant, Joe. It is about his actions and attitudes. He was unable to learn by what he had just experienced, the forgiveness of his debt that he couldn't pay. Instead of giving debt forgiveness to Bill, he is looking for justice and wants what is owed him by Bill. Father Brawl said, excuse me, Father Browsend writes, how often we go through life expecting others to appreciate our special circumstances, to recognize that, after all, I meant well, and all of the other justifications that we find for our own behavior or misbehavior. But let somebody do something to us, forget a commitment that they've made or so on, 
and we are like the most unforgiving lion in the jungle. End of quote. It seems like when we are poor, it's pretty easy for us to be humble and often forgiving. But once we achieve a little something in our lives, once we have a few dollars in our savings account and stock in our portfolio, our ability to be humble becomes more difficult, as does our ability to forgive. We often forget the forgiveness that has been given to us when we start demanding justice for ourselves. The churchy aspect of this story is that we all should recognize that God forgives our debts. Jesus paid the price on the cross, right? John 3, 16, we all have it memorized. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to save the world so that through him everybody might be saved. Paraphrased. But have we truly internalized that concept? Have we become owners of John 3.16? Churchy talk only works in church, my beloved. How well do we practice what we teach? How well do we forgive? How well do we forgive the person who wrongs us? Peter, the apostles, having issues. He's wanting to know, what's the cutoff line? What is that boundary? When can I quit forgiving? How well do we forgive ourselves, even? When we march for a justice issue, how much are we willing to give up for that justice issue? At the end of the movie True Colors, the young man who worked for the Justice Department was emotionally beating himself up because he had used the friendship of his best friend to take down some major political corruption. To be honest, his actions really were an eye for an eye philosophy because his friend had used him, had set him up so that he could continue to achieve his goals. So his boss says to this young man who works for the Justice Department, you joined the Justice Department to set things right, to do justice. Well, son, you don't own it until it costs you something. Tonight, it costs you to do justice. It costs you to do justice. We talk in church about the plight of the poor. But what are we willing to pay to end poverty? We want racial justice, but are we willing to pay the cost? Are we truly willing to pay the cost that ends racism in our country? We talk about access for everyone for adequate health care, but at what price are we willing to pay? We don't own it until it costs us something. Working towards justice cost Jesus his life. Do you think Jesus expects anything less from us? Honestly. Justice is a situational thing for most of us. We find it easy to demand justice when it's in our favor, but hesitate for justice when it's going to cost us money, privilege, status. 
when it costs us humiliation and even turning loose of the power that even holds us captive. Byron Stevens, author, lawyer, social justice advocate, writes in his book, Just Mercy, a story of redemption and justice, says, Proximity has taught me some basic and humbling truths, including this vital lesson each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. My work with the poor and the incarcerated has persuaded me that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Finally, I've come to believe that the true measure of our commitment to justice, the character of our society, our commitment to the rule of law, fairness, and equality cannot be measured by how we treat the rich, the powerful, the privileged, and the respected among us. The true measure of our character is how we treat the poor, the disfavored, the accused, the incarcerated, and the condemned. We are all implicated when we allow other people to be mistreated, he goes on to say. An absence of compassion can corrupt the decency of a community, a state, a nation. Think on that one for a while, please. Fear and anger can make us vindictive and abusive, unjust and unfair. Until we all suffer from the absence of mercy and we condemn ourselves as much as we victimize others. The closer we get to mass incarceration and extreme levels of punishment, the more I believe it's necessary to recognize that we all need mercy. We all need justice. And perhaps we all need some measure of unmerited grace. End of quote. You see... When justice is applied to the other person, it is also being applied to us. The question becomes, are we truly willing to give that justice? Are we truly willing to turn the other cheek? Are we truly willing to give grace and forgiveness? The servant named Joe, for whatever reason, was unable to forgive Bill his debt, even though Joe had received even greater grace by the king. It cost Joe that injustice towards Bill. It cost Joe an eternity of torture and torment. My answer to Peter's question of how many times do I have to forgive, is this. Again, it comes from the movie True Colors. We may not always get what we want. We may not always get what we need. Just so's we don't get what we deserve. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. God's mercy is greater than our own. Amen.